uh, and become much more reflective about them and think about how they influence the things that we're seeing. So by doing this, we can eliminate some of the obvious sources of bias. Now, I'm going to introduce one more little subtlety here, which is I keep talking about the scientists' particular perceptions, particular background, as a bad thing. It's a biasing thing. It's a thing that doesn't allow them to see reality objectively. But it's hard to know, sorry, it's hard to know. I think actually there's probably a productive tension, a good tension in science between one's own personal views and beliefs, one's own cultural background, and sort of what's objectively out there. So the subjective and the objective kind of have to work together in partnership in science. Why do I say that? Well, for as, a, as an example, so in the 70s you had the women's rights movement. And suddenly a lot of attention was being put on issues for women, like women's health. That cultural moment in history had a profound impact on science. So scientists, often men, increasingly women over time, became sensitized to this issue that, hey, we have to look at women's health as well. We can't just look at men. We've got to look at processes of disease uh, and the effects of medication on women's bodies, not just on men's. That came out of a cultural construction. It came out of a, a, the women's movement, in a sense. So you could say that was a biasing mechanism. But maybe it was biasing in a way that opened up inquiry that was very constructive and helpful, especially for women. So what I'm telling you is that science can never be uh, purely objective. There are always subjective elements. But sometimes those subjective elements are very important uh, and, and can be very productive. There's also creativity and imagination in science. Einstein was incredibly creative. Uh, and he envisioned things long before he actually observed them. So that kind of creative genius was incredibly helpful in shaping the very questions he asked about time and space. So that's an example where something that's not objective, something that uh, was idiosyncratic to Einstein, his particular uh, perspective in the world, his particular creative genius, was very helpful in advancing uh, theoretical physics. So there is a place for creativity, for culture, for all of those kinds of subjective aspects. There is a place in science, it's just that science has to have a strong partnership with a kind of objective element. So subjective and objective elements need to work together in a kind of healthy collaboration. Okay, back to the research cycle. So sociological research seeks to overcome some of the kinds of unscientific thinking that can occur because of these subjective elements. Um, we generally think of research as a cyclical thing, meaning it doesn't just sort of start and end. It continues on and on and on as a community project. Uh, there are eight steps, as you can see. We've already gone through the first four. So let's fast forward to the fifth, which is collecting your data. So in other words, after you figured out first what matters to you to look into, second, you produce the hypothesis for a kind of testable pet theory that would explain what you're looking at. Three, you go to the stacks, you go to the literature, you go to your computer, you go to the search engine, uh, and you search the existing literature on the topic that you're interested in and see what's out there. Four, you select a, an appropriate method uh, the method that you use needs to be appropriate for the question that you ask. Some methods are much better at answering some kinds of questions than others. So you choose a method that uh, is effective for answering your particular question. And then, now five, you collect your data. Uh, you observe your subjects, you do a participant observation, you interview them, you conduct a survey, maybe you read documents about them. Maybe you're doing an organizational analysis at the University of Toronto, and you want all of the minutes of the meetings between president, the president and the deans. So you look at those minutes to find some sort of evidence of something. 
Okay, now, since the 1970s, there's been a huge move in science across the university to bring in human ethics. You need to treat your subjects ethically. Um, there was a time, there were many uh, res research projects that were being done that would actually solicit college students. So you had your professor, and he or she was doing his or her research, and he thought, aha, let me bring in some of these uh, undergrads, let them be of use, finally. Let them come in, and uh, we're going to conduct an experiment, like let's say the effects of um, psychological abuse on IQ scores. So the undergrads are brought in, and a set are exposed to some terrible psychological abuse, like maybe a confederate, a guy or a, a, a girl who's working for the scientist comes in and starts screaming, uh, and saying really mean, belligerent things to them. And then immediately, those students who were exposed to the screaming confederate get whisked away, and they have to quickly answer 10 IQ questions, right? So, um, well, maybe there were some bad psychological effects of that. I mean, if you were just blindly going into a research, let's say Green had a, a research project, come students to my research laboratory, and you came, you were innocently waiting maybe to take a little test, or I don't know, uh, and all of a sudden, three kids run in and start screaming at you that you're ugly, and you're fat, and you have no business in the university. That's not very nice, right? But actually, those kinds of things happen in the 50s and 60s. This is quite, quite common. There were some terrible experiments done on uh, humans, let alone animals. Uh, you can see some of this on YouTube. I'm going to spare you that today. Though, you know, I usually don't like to spare you, but I will today. There's some awful things that went on. So as a consequence, universities developed these ethics boards, and, and there are, are sort of stringent ethical considerations about human subjects. And that's the sixth aspect. Now I have a slide for you, but I think these things in part, in part are so obvious uh, that I'm going to let you review that on your own. So do review those. Okay, back to the research cycle, the seventh step, analyzing the data. Okay, so this can be the exciting part of the research cycle. You look at your data, uh, you find things that maybe nobody knew before, maybe you confirm certain theories you found in the literature, you can reject other theories that you found uh, in the literature, maybe you'll abandon your pet theory and say, aha, the data shows now that I'm analyzing it, I really wasn't right. Um, and maybe it'll help you produce a new theory to explain what you're finding. Now number eight, once you've analyzed your data and you can speak back to the existing literature on the topic, you now have something to say. And so part of the industry of science, and I'm using that word very, very purposefully, industry, is that the researcher has to publicize those findings to become a name in the field and also uh, to continue the scientific endeavor, meaning that research is of no value to anybody if it's not published so that other people can come, other students can look and read it and see, see what you found. So you have to write up your results and you have to publish them. You have to disseminate them in some way. This is a critical part of the research cycle because once the research is out there in the journals, in books, then other Students, scientists, can go and read it and think about it and scrutinize it. Maybe they see something that you forgot to do. Maybe there's an obvious methodological bias that they find. Um, maybe your findings really aren't as strong as you think they are. And so those particular people are now obligated, as part of the scientific project, to sort that out. Maybe they'll do their own research and try to replicate your findings. And if they can't replicate them, then that becomes a real problem. Uh, maybe they'll, they'll do a similar experiment and find something very different. Uh, or maybe they'll write a theoretical piece or a methodological piece that just says, look, these are the great weaknesses in Green's argument, A, B, C, and D. And sometimes those things get published. So in a way, what you have is a back and forth in science, right? You have a kind of cycle a process whereby 
the scientist, goes out, does research, publishes it, but it's not the last word because other scientists and students will review that work and then come back with their own. So it's an ongoing conversation. Science is an ongoing conversation. And it's an ongoing conversation at many levels. Um, you can have sort of a debate about a specific finding, but you can also have paradigmatic contests, meaning contests over whole paradigms. Uh, the closest thing in sociology we have to a paradigm might be like the conflict school, or the functionalist school, or the symbolic interaction school. There are others, like in physics, Newtonian uh, and Einsteinian uh, physics. Those are two very different kinds of paradigms. Uh, one replaced the other. How? Well, it replaced the other when Newtonian physics stopped explaining things that scientists needed to explain. And those anomalies or those errors, those inability, uh, that inability to explain certain phenomena grew and grew and grew over time. Science is an ongoing conversation until eventually a group of scientists splintered off into a whole new paradigm, a whole new way of thinking about the world. So I'm trying to give you a sense of the dynamic and fluid and cyclical nature of science. Okay, so let's fast forward now to a particular kind of method. We're going to talk about this method because in a way it's so obvious parts of it that I think you'll all be able to relate to it. Participant observation, I'm sure you've heard it. In a way you've all done it in a certain informal way. You're all participant observers. Uh, like that baby in the video <laughs> observing everything around itself, becoming a participant observer like a little scientist learning about regularities and patterns in the world and how they fit together. So you've all done participant observation in a certain informal way. Uh, in this method, participant observation, you'll see, according to the slide, um, the researcher observes the social milieu from an outsider's point of view and takes part in the activity of their subjects. So there's a kind of duality there. There's both, I am from outside of this community, therefore I can have a kind of outsider, maybe critical perspective, but then also I sit within the community and I act within it to try to get a native, if you will, perspective. So participant observation is particularly powerful as a method because it allows the researcher to go in and really understand firsthand what's going on uh, in, with the community that they're studying. So if you wanted to understand what uh, large lecture classes are like in Canada, probably one of the best ways to do that is to start off as a participant observer. By the way, you should note that there are a number of participant observers here. They've been here this entire term, observing, taking field notes, watching you, seeing what you're doing, listening. See, I get field reports. I get field reports every week, I know. You think I don't know, but I know. <laughs> anyway, so these folks are trying to understand what life is like as an undergraduate student at a big university like U of T, at a big lecture hall. What's it like? What goes on? So the best way to do that is to sit in the class itself. Now, if they just distributed a survey to you on your way out and you filled out some questions, closed-ended questions about your experience, that would give the researcher one kind of data. But you see how sitting in the class itself and listening and watching and taking notes, some of them have little video videos going on I can see later today. So doing all of that kind of observational work that will give them a very different perspective on what's really going on in the class than a survey. So this goes back to the point that the method that you choose determines what bit of reality you dig up from the ground. So, we, so if you use a, a survey method, the researcher might get one impression about what's happening in the class. 
But by being a participant observer, by sitting in the class and getting hot and getting annoyed at these lectures and watching students get annoyed, building stuff, that gives a much richer, in some sense, or a different perspective on what's really going on in the class. So the method really does shape what you see, and that's an example of it. Okay. Uh, one of the best known participant observation uh, research in sociology was done by a sociologist named Mitch Deneer. Uh, Mitch Deneer was uh, a graduate student in sociology, and he decided that he was going to look into this phenomenon of New York City book vendors. Um, there was, in fact, in the I guess it's late 80s and 90s, there was this phenomenon, suddenly um, racialized minority men and some women were taken to the streets and setting up little stands uh, in New York City, in the village, where they would find books, they would take books and magazines and posters, they would find them from the trash around the city, like they'd go to the Upper East Side to the wealthy neighborhoods, and they would retrieve all of these books and posters, some of them were in perfectly great condition, and magazines, and they would bring them downtown, and they would set up shop literally on the street, often illegally, but so they would set up their little table, and they'd put out all their books, uh, and they would try to sell them, maybe a dollar or two, uh, depending on the book or the magazine. And it became a kind of, um, in part, an attraction, one of the things that was fun to walk through the village and see all of these different uh, book vendors and stuff. But it also had criminal elements. It had a little bit of everything. And so Denier was really interested in this phenomenon of the book vendors. And he wanted to know more about it. So what he decided to do is not pass out a survey and ask them questions, the book vendors, but actually he became a book vendor. He went into the city and for a few years actually became just like the other book vendors. He would search the trash, he'd get up early in the morning, he would lug all of his findings downtown, set up a table, sell, begin to converse with other book vendors. So he really immersed himself in that social milieu to try to understand it as much as possible. Okay, I'm going to play you two little snippets of it. It's a, it's a very famous uh, piece of participant research that was written up in a book. And uh, it's something that you should see. It's both, you're going to see in part a video aspect of it. So someone was so interested in this project that they came down and they actually videotaped it. So you'll see some of the videotape of what he was actually doing. And then also there's a little bit of methodological discussion on his part uh, in a second video. Now I want to just say one thing about, uh, about this particular study. The study is about specifically one case of book vendors in New York City. And so you can think to yourself, well, how much can that really tell you sociologically? What, one of the great things about Tamir's work is he was able to take what happened at a local micro level between book vendors, between book vendors and police, between book vendors and customers, and begin to draw up from that micro data up, up, up into a broader level of analysis about policing, about uh, criminal uh, practices in New York City, um, about racialization, about how a particular racialized group dealt with economic hardship. So you see, even though this was one very particular case uh, around one particular set of book vendors, nevertheless, the data that he gathered allowed him to begin to speak sociologically off the ground up into much broader social processes and structures. And so that's part of what makes this work so interesting. It's both so rich at the micro level because he immerses himself in that scene, but also because of the theoretical points he's able to make about crime, about deviance, about racialization, about poverty, about survival, all of those kinds of things. called Sidewalk, by the way.
Uh, just also a note, this video that I'm about to show you, it's actually available, has eight parts to it. I'm only going to show you a small snippet of part one and part five. If you're interested, it's available on YouTube for all eight parts. The first ever time I 
became homeless, it was 12 years ago. This is where I came to the village. Even though I had got my life together, went back living with my family, had a job working at Bethesda Hospital and all that, I still came to the village. I feel like I'm part of this community. This is my job, you know, I come here every day to make money to support myself and my family. Why, but we've been together for 19 years. I got seven kids. I picked up my drink and after my wife had cancer, I eventually was discarded out to the streets. <laughs> I had enough general knowledge just to exist. And if I wanted to, I could have I could have eventually started living. But alcohol that took over my life. Thank you. 